This is the third part in the series, This I Believe. Today I'm going to talk about I believe in the true gospel. But firstly, would you please welcome my wife, Beverly Carter. On my recent visit to Australia, I called dozens of our friends in that fair land. Now, as I spoke to these dear people, I was greatly blessed to see how their trust in God keeps them firm in their faith and their hope. Now, for those watching down under, I, with John, all of the church family here, want to send you our very warmest greetings and our best wishes. As most of you know, the Cartery engages in evangelism, in taking the gospel to those who have never heard. But my visit to Australia made me realize just how important ministries like ours are to those who live in restricted situations. Let me explain. Many of the people I talk to live in small or not so small country towns with a handful of church members, one church and they have a minister who visits them once or twice a month. Now, those of us who live in the city and who are surrounded by a host of churches and who have a regular minister may find it hard to comprehend what it is like not to have this privilege. These dear people living in isolated areas tell me how they thank God for ministries like ours, 3ABN, Hope and others. I spoke to a lady living in a town with only two families who are Adventists. They meet each Sabbath in her home and they watch the sermons on 3ABN. So even though these two families are restricted by their isolation from other churches, they are using Christian broadcast encouragement and also to reach out to others. Another person I spoke to was a very colourful gentleman from Lightning Rick an isolated part of New South Wales and which is famous for its opals. And Len, I know you're watching and John and I also want to say our very best regards. Over the years, Len has given out thousands of the book, Your Bible and You, mainly to that visit that well-known city or town. Now, Len, with many others, could just sit down, feel sorry for themselves and do nothing. But their Christianity is not based on circumstances, but rather on a close walk with God. Then there are those who are restricted physically because of some serious illness. They are unable to attend church. Two are thankful for churches like ours who telecast their services. And some of these who can get DVDs messages and hand them out to their neighbours. After hearing all these testimonies, two words kept ringing in my ears, amazing grace. And that's what John is preaching about today. Let's remember, after Jesus, the Apostle Paul was the greatest and teacher of the gospel. But we also remember that he was put in jail. He was, had many restrictions in his lifetime, actually, put in jail under house arrest, but during these times, he wrote some of the greatest truths ever written. And so focusing on our restriction, be it a health problem, marriage, family, work, or even a sleep one, and a couple of folk had that one, you know. Whatever it is, let us focus instead on opportunities of witness our Lord. In the words of Paul, without him we can't do anything, but with him we can do all things. Get this subject right and you'll get everything right. Well, let me come over here to the blackboard as I start today the third part of the series, I Believe. In the true gospel. And yet, my friend, there are 
many Gospels. If you read the book of Galatians, it says there are other Gospels. In fact, there are many Gospels, but only, only one uh, true Holy Gospel. Many Gospels. There's a new Gospel. It's the big, well, it's the government Gospel. The government will save you. So if there's any problem in America, we look to the government. The president is going to come on his horse riding along and he's going to save us. That's what a lot of people believe. They have a gospel, the good news of the government. Uncle Sam will save us. There are many Gospels, but only one. Remember, this is tremendously important. Get this and you'll be right. Get this wrong and you'll be wrong and everything will be wrong. And so today we're going to talk by the grace of God about the one true holy gospel. And today we have a special guest and I want you to welcome our special guest, Mr. Jack Canis. Can we welcome Jack today? <laughs> Now, Jack, you're going to read us a text, please. John, and we've got people here to turn to John chapter 3, 16 and 17, and Jack is going to read it. For God so loved the world, gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Very good, Jack. Shall we thank Jack today? Thank you, Jack. Good. Good. That's the theme text. Theme text. John chapter 3. For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen to this story. Story years ago. It is a true story. There was a father who took his son to work. Kids love to go to work with their fathers, particularly fathers work around locomotives and trains. The father worked up in the sky in the control box. He had a special job. He worked the big levers that switched the tracks. You know how they do it? At least that's how they used to. Guy up in the control tower, he would pull the, the levers, great big things. And that would switch the tracks. He took his little he said to his little boy, don't get out of my sight. But he was, the father was tremendously busy. Then his little boy, his name was Dan, was missing. The train was coming through any moment. He could hear the whistle of the train, that great big steam engine down the track and pulling all those carriages with hundreds and hundreds of people. The train was doing about 70 miles an hour and it was running down the track. And the father looked out the window, down at the railway lines. He saw that the train was going ahead. It was going straight into a dead end, but before it got there, he was going to switch the tracks. So the train was going to come along like this and then the other track and go thundering down the correct track. And when he looked out the window, there was his little boy, David not playing on the dead end track, but playing where the train was going to come. He had his life, the life of his little boy in his hands. And he also had in his hands the lives of hundreds and hundreds of people on the train as it came roaring and rumbling down the track. What would you have done? Here's your little boy. 
He looked at his boy. His little boy had his daddy's heart in his hands. What would you have done? There's a train. Think about it. Please, think about it. Here's a train, and it's coming down the track, and you can send it straight ahead, or you can send it over your little boy. What are you going to do? Well, the father did his duty with a prayer for his boy after crying out, David, he couldn't, the little boy couldn't hear the, his daddy's voice because of the roar of that great steam engine. You know what the father did? He took the levers in his hands and he switched the tracks. And the train going this way went where it right over his son. I want you to think about that because if you get the gospel, the true gospel right, you'll be right. You want to really know why so many people have got their lives messed up. Do you really want to know? You want to know why some people just are unstable, unhappy, they can't be dependent on everything they do, they seem to mess it up. You want to know the real reason? You want to know why this world seems worse and worse, as my boy David used to say when he was a little boy, worser and worser. <laughs> why is the world worser and worser? Because there are many gospels and they've got the wrong one. That's why. But if you get this right, you'll be right. But if you don't get it right, you won't be right. Jesus, talking to the religious leaders of his day, said something that for a long time I couldn't quite get. Jesus said, be careful about your eye. He said, if your eye is bad, your whole body is going to be full of darkness. He said, if your eye is good, your whole body is going to be full of light. The reason, my friend, many people, maybe some of you sitting here today, the reason lives are full of darkness is because you've got a bad eye. Is he talking about this eye? No, he's talking about the spiritual eye. And Paul says that you cannot understand the gospel unless the Holy Spirit comes and reveals it to you. And so we need to pray, God, from the awful sin of playing church and help me to see. Today. Because if I get it right, everything will be right. The whole world needs saving we are all sinners. Come over here to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Romans chapter 5, turn to the text. Roman, and don't think you know it because you probably don't understand it. Romans 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Every one of us has sinned. We've all broken the holy law of God a million times. We have sinned even when we didn't know sinning. The whole world is guilty before God. Romans 3 verse 9 says, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles are like all under sin, there is no one righteous, not even one. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned, past tense, and fall short, present tense, present continuous, and fall short of the glory of God. This, my friends, let this saying sink down into your ears. It is a mystery to me why people, Christian people, think that the government is the Savior. You know why? Because they haven't got it right. They haven't got the gospel right. They're walking in darkness. Our problem is not fundamentally 
political or social. Now I say to my American friends, the Americans, we all cheer when we get a new president. Twelve months later, we want him out of office. And we do it year after year after year because of unreal expectations. He's a sinner the same as you are, same as I am. Our problem is not fundamentally political, social, economic, psychological, but spiritual. And unless you can deal with it spiritually, you won't get it right. A spiritual problem needs a spiritual solution. There is a terrible that has infected every person on the planet, in the White House, in the Congress, everywhere in this church. You've got it, and I've got it. It's the virus of sin. We were born with it. And the evidence of sin is everywhere. Hate. I read where people were trying to kill a, a senator. He's passed away now was filled with insecurity because people wanted to kill him because of hate. How sad. How evil. Hate. Lying. Stealing. Racism. White racism, black racism, racism. Impurity. Cruelty. Gossiping. Sabbath breaking. Idolatry. You know the story of the man who used to work in a big factory? And every night he'd walk out at the same time, pushing a wheelbarrow. And they would search him, search his body, and they would look at the wheelbarrow. They even would take the wheel off. So they disassembled the whole wheelbarrow before they put it back together again and sent him on his way. But for week after week, after month, he came through the door with a wheelbarrow. It wasn't until years later they discovered killing wheelbarrows. <laughs> now your sin and my sin may not be evident, but we're all sinners, and that train is coming. It's rumbling down the track. We all need salvation and redemption. Jesus, God's own son, became a man, perfect life, and paid for my sins with his own blood on the cross. We Adventist Christians do not believe in the modern theory, even though it may be in our midst. We believe in the blood of of our Savior on the cross. Let everybody hear this. Amen. And I'm talking here in Southern California where the influence is like a cancer. Look at Romans 3, 23 and onwards. For all have sinned. Romans 3 and onwards. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, declared righteous, freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. The margin says, as the one who would turn aside his wrath, taking away sin. God turned aside the Father's wrath from us. A sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his because in his forbearance he'd left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice. God must be just at the present time, so as to be just and the one who defies those who have faith in Jesus. Listen to me. A train came rumbling down the track. And that train bore the wrath of God. You say, God doesn't have wrath. Don't you read the Bible? The Bible is full of the wrath of God, especially 
the book of Romans, the wrath of God revealed, it says in Romans 1. That train came thundering down the track. On its side was the Lord of God. The wrath of God. And because we had broken the law of God, and because Jesus came and stood in our place, the train came rumbling over and took his life. Either you or him. Get this right, you'll be right. If you don't get it right, it's going to be right. Your church is not going to be right. Your business is not going to be right. Your mind is not going to be right. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they came seeking Jesus. You know the story. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they came seeking Jesus. The soldiers came, and they came with swords, and with torches. You know what that represents? The Lord. The law came after him because he had assumed my sin and my guilt because he loves us. He turned and he said to them, who do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, that's me. If you want me, let the their way. That's the gospel. Take me. Let these go their way. Don't think that Forgiveness is cheap. The train came rumbling down the track and the Father up in heaven pulled the levers and sent the train of the wrath of God over his son. Don't tell me it's cheap. Cost the life of God's own son. Pastor J.B. Keith was a great missionary. I well. He became a leader of the church in the South Pacific. He had worked in Papua New Guinea, areas where there were headhunters and cannibals. He went into an area that had never ever seen a white man. He took with him a translator, two or three others, because nobody was prepared to go. He told me as he came over the brow of the hill, there stretched out right up the valley were thousands of warriors with spears and with bows and arrows twanging the string. He probably had five minutes to live. Swords up, spears ready to go, everything. The man was going down, one would think. Then Pastor Keith did something which is wonderful. He took out his Bible and he told those headhunters the story of Christ. Started to tell how God, big fella long top, came down. How the big fella came down. And how the big fella died for our sins on the cross. People did not even have the word love in their language. And then all of a sudden, the man who was the chief ran and seized Pastor Keith and held him and ran off with him. And the spears were up again and the bows are twanging. He thought, I'm a dead man. And in the end, the chief put him down. And the translator, who'd been left behind, caught up. And the chief said, I'm not going to let you go. He said, when you told the story of how the big fella long top God came down, he said, here. Has it touched you there? Or have you got less appreciation? of the gospel than a savage in the highlands of New Guinea who's a headhunter and a cannibal. That whole place today where it once was filled with fighting and killing and murders and filth 
and cannibalism is filled with church churches. Mm -hmm. As the poet said, only a sense of sin bought can melt a heart of stone. How long is God going to spend on how many more opportunities, my friend, is he going to give you and me? He's given us more opportunities possibly than anybody else in the world. And we look upon church as something to be enjoyed or perhaps endured until we can get outside and fill our bellies, until we're busted. Get this right, and you'll be wrong. Get it wrong, everything will be wrong. Your family will be wrong. Your children will be wrong. All of your relationships will be wrong. Your business will be bad. But a sense a blood board pardon can melt a heart of stone. We're very pleased to have in our church a, um, a Jewish background, Blake Wexler. Would you please welcome Blake Wexler? <laughs> welcome, welcome here today, Blake. We're delighted to have you as a member of our church. We're proud of you. We know that you come from a Jewish background and that will always remain with you. But today you have some comments and a question. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, you know, I always have this on my mind. Orthodox Judaism believes in keeping the law, the Torah, mm -hmm. perfectly. Yes. And if God requires 100% perfection, what hope do I have? If God requires that Bessler in himself be 100% 100, 100 perfect, you, like John Carter, have got no hope at all. But I want you to text. I want you to come with us, Blake, over here. I want you to read the text. The congregation is going to turn to Romans 3 and verse 20 and 22. And we're going to concentrate on this and we're going to think about it. Romans 3, verse 21, 22. Blake, thank you. But righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness. God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. A Jewish man, of course, and he was a Pharisee. He was versed in the Torah. But he says, we are saved by righteousness apart from the law. And so the text tells me, Blake, and this is an amazing text, it doesn't depend upon my goodness, it depends upon his goodness. There was a famous man in church. You've heard us talk about him on many occasions. There would have been no America without this man, no Australia, no freedom, no in the world. His name was Martin Luther. Martin Luther had a strong Roman Catholic background, and Luther was taught that Justification is a process whereby we get better and better and better until at last we're 100% in keeping the law. He was in darkness, he was in depression, but the day came when Luther was found kneeling before six and sobbing, for me, for me. And so whether this is for a Jewish person, a Gentile person, an Australian, an American, whoever it is. Righteousness comes to us not because of our success in keeping the law, but because of his success in keeping the law and because he died for our sins. That is the true gospel. I'm proud of you, Blake. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Another person in this church whom we love and hold in the highest esteem 
is Cindy Chula. Would you please welcome our friend uh, Cindy Chula. Cindy, glad to see you here today. Um, Pastor Carter, my ancestors came from that, re that uh, witnessed the great Protestant Reformation. And out of that arose many other great movements for Christianity and Christ. My question is, if Christ cross for us, why does the world seem to be getting worse and worse? If he died to save us, why does the world seem to be getting worse and worse? Your observation is, is absolutely correct. The world is getting worse and worse. Uh, as we gaze around America today and see a tremendous deterioration in what America once was. Uh, many people across the are, are amazed and dazed. They say, why are things getting so bad? This is true around the world. Now take a place like India. Now Jesus said he was the light of the world. He said he was the way, the truth, and the life. He's the light of the world. Where Jesus is not, you got darkness. And uh, as David told us some time back, when he visited India and saw the caste system, the dung ladies who worked for $2 a month or something, they carried dung on their heads. Men whose only job is to work in the sewers because of religion, they're lower, they're considered to be worse than vermin. This is because the light of Christ is not there. Where Christ goes, the Bible goes, you have the elevation of society. The happiest people in the world are the people who have a Bible, who read it, and who believe in it. But there's a second reason. And I want you to take your Bible, Cindy, please, and read us a text, 2 Peter chapter 2, 19 to 2 Peter chapter 2. You need glasses? Yes, I, do. I would never have thought, you know. Yeah, I've never seen you before. You've helped, you've, you've done it very well, haven't you, Cindy? I can so, try, but it yeah. might be so I know, I know, I know. We may get the wrong book, too. Second Peter 19 and onwards. Let's read the text to the people. They promised them freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. For a man is slave to whatever has mastered him. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then to turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the Proverbs a dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. Wow. A strong passage. Dog goes back to his vomit. It's talking about a person who known the truth and goes back to the old way, and a sow that was washed goes back to wallowing in the mire. Cindy, look at me. There's <laughs> <laughs> no darkness so dark as light rejected. There are some countries that had amazing light. The United States of America, I think the most blessed of all countries, was light. This place was found by godly people who believed in the Bible, who believed in the supremacy of Christ, and who believed in the commandments. These have had great light. Great Britain, Germany, Australia, marvelous light. But today, Cindy, there is an active war in our universities, even in some of our churches, Christ and the Bible. There's a war against everything that this book stands for. And thus, as the Bible and the true gospel are rejected, so a terrible darkness takes over the people. You have You have every awful, terrible sin. People become mentally and emotionally unstable. You can't depend upon them. They'll tell you one thing, but you know, yes means no. <laughs> no means yes. You can't depend on them. It is a deterioration of the whole person as the truth of God is rejected. 
our only safety is in walking according to the truth that God has us and by reading our Bibles every day. Cindy, in the book of Revelation, there's a picture of the white horse that goes forth. But straight after the white horse, there comes the red horse. The white horse represents the preaching of the gospel. Whenever the gospel is preached, the red horse is close at hand. Therefore, if we get this right, everything will be right. But if we get this wrong, everything will be wrong. And you are a blessing in our church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another very wonderful person whom we love in this church is Marcy Ruth. Would you please welcome Marcy. Marcy, you look so nice today. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor, I am a vice president of a large bank here in Los Angeles. That's why I'm nice to you. <laughs> but today, there is a lot of uncertainty in this world. Pastor, can I be certain of my salvation? Marcy, this is the great question. We can only be certain of our salvation if we're certain of the gospel. If we get this right, everything's going to be right. Marcy, would you put the text to us? That text is John chapter 10 and verse 27 and onwards. John chapter 10, verse 11. John 10, verse 11, and then verse 27 and onwards. And it answers your very good question, Marcy. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Marcy, the amazing news is this, that if you're in the Father's hand, you're perfectly safe. Once you come to Christ and hold on to him, he'll hold on to you. There was a little plaque in Dr. Moody's uh, office that said, holding. God holds on to us. We all know about Mother Teresa, don't we? A famous woman. She did so much for the lepers in India and other places. But when she died, her letters were published. It was discovered, and the world was shocked, that Mother Teresa never had a day of She was continually depressed. There were times when she wanted to become an atheist. You know why? Get this right and everything will be right. Get this right and everything will be wrong. Mother Teresa was taught a theology by the great organization called the Jesuits that taught justification was a process. Now, the Bible says being justified by faith, we have peace with God. They believe that justification is not instantaneous merits of Christ's death, but it is a process that is done in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And it takes forever and ever. In other words, they can sanctification and justification. And therefore, when she died, she died with fear. Every person who believes this terrible anti-Christian theology. As a pastor, I've met with many, many people who believe that theology. Even in our own churches, they believe they're not good enough. But the good news is... Uh, we don't do good to be saved. You've got to be saved to do good. And when Jesus comes into your heart, Jesus changes you. That's after you justified. He changes, changes you inside, and you become a new person. And so, Marcy, when we have Christ and Christ, and when we believe in the true gospel, we need never be afraid again. And you are a blessing, Marcy. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Marcy is just a very, very special person. Now, there's something else you've got to realize, too. I want you to think about this. 
Some people are scared to death because their church says, if I excommunicate you, you're going to hell. Have you heard this taught? Well, I want you to know something. The church doesn't keep the books. <laughs> God keeps the books. <laughs> God keeps the books. If you're right with God, the church can kick you out. The church can defame you. The church can do lots of awful things to you, but nothing can change your relationship to God. So remember, if you get this right, what about it? Everything's going to be right. Ron Buck in our church, a person we love and appreciate. And he's been in our church for a long time now. And we want to welcome today. Would you please welcome Ron Buck? Ron, what's your question? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> Mr. Carter, I came to this church originally because I had a lot of curiosity about what was going on here. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, the sermons I heard I didn't like, mm -hmm. simply because they were contrary to my theology, my understanding at that time of my life. But we have a wonderful God. He taught me a long way, and I now have a much deeper understanding of the gospel than I ever had before. But in my Christian walk, I've encountered individuals in my church mm -hmm that based their salvation on their perfect keeping of the law of God, uh, perfectionists. Hmm. At the same time, I've encountered other groups that uh, are so liberal. Uh, they claim the law of God has been done away with. Hmm. The law anymore. Hmm. Pastor Carter, what does the Bible say about these things uh, that are such a, uh, an enemy? Hmm. Great question. Let's turn, Ron, please, in your Bible. And the congregation do the same. Romans chapter 3 and verse 28 and then 31. Romans chapter 3. Everybody turn to the text, please. Romans 3 and verse 28, verse 31. This gives us a balance. Thanks, Ron. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. You got two texts there. Martin Luther told the story of the drunken German. He said, if he didn't fall off the left side, he fell off the right side. That's like most folks when they get on the gospel horse. If they don't fall off on the left side, they fall off on the right side. Paul says, um, we declare that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Therefore, I come to Christ with all my sins, with all my sins, and I accept what Christ has done for me. And I am justified. I come as a penitent sinner. But then one says, does this faith do away with the law of God? No, this faith establishes the law of God. So when a person, so there are the heresy of antinomianism that says that the law is abolished and you can do what you like and the second heresy is, is legalism that's pharisaism that says that i must be saved by climbing up the quaking sides of sinai and when i'm good enough god's going to say well done you can come in now but the gospel tells me Christ is my savior and I'm saved through him, not through me. But because I'm saved through him, because I love him, I will want to obey him and serve him. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Ron. Thank you. We love you. Thank you. <laughs> love and appreciate all these people. Mm. Now, a very special person in this church whom we all love and admire is Elma Dixon. Would you please welcome my sister, Elma Dixon. Mm. Elmer, mighty glad today to see you here in church. I'm so happy to see you, Pastor Carter. Mm. Um, Elmer, you've got something you're going to say. To yes. You know, Pastor Carter, my ancestors come from Africa, and I got to tell you. I you're kidding. Yes. No. You're putting me on, Elmer. No. I could believe that of Cindy. No, but anyhow. Actually, some are darker than me. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And, you know, I was really glad to hear that this year you're going to Africa to, to preach the true gospel. 
Because here in the United States, the prosperity gospel is continually preached. And unfortunately, the prosperity gospel is being preached in Africa also with poverty. Now my question to you, Pastor Carter, why is, is the prosperity gospel such a great fake? And Elmer, you've called it a fake. It's a fake because it is a fake. I want you to read to the, this text, please, to the good folks here. John 16 and verse 33. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 16 and it's verse 33, Elmer, dear. You want me to read it? Yes. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. Take heart, I have overcome the world. In this world, what does it say, Elmer? In this world you will have trouble. I have trouble. The prosperity gospel say, give your life to Jesus and everything is a bed of roses, you say. But Jesus said, in this world you're going to have trouble. You don't find that God has called us to prosperity. He's called us to faithfulness and to obedience. I believe that if we obey his word, we're going to have a great degree, Elmer, of prosperity. God is going to bless us. But I have a prosperity gospel. Yes. Jesus is coming. And when Jesus comes, it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Visualize it the beautiful city, the streets of gold. We're going to have mansions. I wonder if you're going to look like me if I'm going to look I think you'll be a little bit taller and darker. Oh, well, that sort of tells me. But let's get back to, the, get back to this little vision we're talking about. Can't you see it? The new Jerusalem, the gold. You're going to have a mansion, and I'm going to have a mansion. Maybe we'll be neighbors. I think so. Maybe we'll do a garden together. Uh, that, I hadn't thought about that, Elmer, but anyhow, that just may be so, as long as you don't grow broccoli or any of that stuff. One day, we're going to have, because of the gospel, a wonderful, wonderful home. We're proud of you, Elmer. Thank you. Thank you. I want to tell you a story. I can never get it out of my soul. I was running a big series of meetings in the Dallas Brooks in Melbourne. I want to say hello to my friends in Melbourne. I love the city of Melbourne. It's a big theater downtown called the Dallas Brooks Theater. And after a while, after you've been running the meetings week after week after week, even though you've got thousands coming, you start to recognize people in the audience. Just like I recognized Sylvia there before. <laughs> you, should, you, know. you get to know people. They get close to you. There was a beautiful girl who used to come in night after night with her husband and two little kids. She to come, but she stopped coming. Now, if you're running a series of meetings, you wonder why people stop coming. People stop coming for all sorts of reasons. It is because the Spirit of God is getting to their hearts. They don't like hearing what they're hearing. So I would go off and I'd visit. And so I went off and visited these folks. He took me into their bedroom with the two little kids. She was lying propped up in the pillows. All her beautiful hair was gone. She's dying of cancer. I will never forget, I sat down at the bedside with the husband of the two kids. She said this to me. Because up to this point of time, she was not a Christian. She said, I'm going to die and I'm scared to death. If you don't, you've got reason to. Because the train's coming, folks. That big old train's coming down the track. If you don't let Jesus be your place, you're going to stand alone. But I told her the story of the gospel. I read to her the promises of the Bible. I read to her about the... She said, I just had hoped I could see my children grow up. I said, it doesn't look like this is going to happen. But one day you're going to have something better in glory. And as I talked to her, it was sort of wonderful because the fear went out of her eyes. She got teary. I led her to Christ, told her the steps to go through. And I told her, because of Jesus, you are now right with 
right with God, right now. She got it right. Consequently, everything will be right. I say to you today, believe in the gospel. I believe in the gospel. This, I believe. Amen. Amen. Let us kneel. Our Father, we thank you that because you love us so much, you gave your Son to be our substitute. And he was on the tracks of justice when the wrath of God came thundering through. We think of the word that we spoke about last week. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by the curse for us. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. We think that this is not good advice today, but it's the good news of what has been done by somebody us. And we know today if we get this wrong, everything's going to be wrong. We pray that you'll give us good eyes so we can see, so that our whole body will be full of light and glory. We thank you today for the story of a God who loved us that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Our Father, with our conscious consciences awakened by the promptings of the Spirit of God, we would come to you. We would come not as righteous people, but as sinners, all of us, religious and some irreligious but we come as penitent sinners. As we're praying in our day with every head bowed, every eye closed, all of us on our knees, recognizing that we are great sinners, how many will raise a hand and say, I now believe, I do believe, that Jesus died for me. Raise your hand if that is your prayer. I now, I do believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that he went through the agony of the cross to save me from agony. I believe today that he suffered the wrath of God so that I could have and can have peace with God. And today we raise our hands and our hearts and we thank you for the God. Bless these dear people here today. Anoint our eyes with eyes of that we may see. Clothe us with a robe of righteousness so that we will not be naked. Forgive us our transgressions and grant us through Jesus Christ our Lord peace God because of the forgiveness of our sins. We worship you. We thank you. We bless you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.